nothing, so I am going to read. <laughs> so first, uh, this is an extraordinary opportunity, and there are lots of people to thank. And the first one is actually not here. It's Ma Maria Laura Mosco, and she did an enormous amount of work for it. So uh, she's the first one. Then, of course, we have to think, uh, thank Professor Portelli for uh, for accepting our invitation to come here uh, on his way back to Rome. So he's going to be doing a lot of traveling, and uh, so thank you very much for being here. Then, of course, everybody who's here, because you probably uh, want to go home and start cooking the turkey <laughs> for Thanksgiving. Uh, Kalin, uh, Mihalescu, uh, and Victoria Wolf, uh, who uh, supported this event with the seminar on transatlantic uh, uh, studies. Uh, Diana Vichkova, Oh, they are right in front of me. <laughs> and Andrea Privitera, who is here, oh, here, okay, uh, for the help in the technical aspect. Uh, Dr. Alexander Freud and Noel Riley, co directors of the Oral History Center, University of Winnipeg, for accommodating Professor Porte, he was over there, <laughs> uh, for accommodating his uh, travel uh, here so that he could stop at Western. So I know that all of you are here because of the great reputation of Dr. Portelli. Uh, he is a professor emeritus of Anglo-American literature at the University of Rome, La Sapienza, and continues to lecture all over the world, most recently at Princeton and Columbia uh, this past spring. His interest in oral history has pervaded his entire scholarly and teaching activity. In 1972, he founded the Ciccolo Gianni Bosio. In Rome, an activist collective focusing on oral history, folklore, and culture. He is also a member of the board of IRSIFAR, the Roman Institute for the History of Italy from Fascism to the Resistance. He has published extensively on American literature, on Washington Irving, Joseph Conrad, Mark Twain, Woody Guthrie, and African American writers. His book, The Death of Rigi Trastulli and Other Stories, translated into Spanish in 1989 and into English in 1991, is widely considered as a groundbreaking work in oral history and the investigation of history and society by uh, eyewitness testimony. They say in Harlem County, he is volume about the mining community of Harlem County, Kentucky, won the Weatherford Award of the Appalachian Studies Association for the best nonfiction book on Appalachia, published in 2010. Another important book, Lordine e Stato e Serito, the order has been carried out, has exposed the fictitious narrative of a Nazi mass killing in Rome in 1944. More recently, he has published Memory Urban, Musiche Migrante, I'm sorry, I don't speak Italian, in Italian. Uh, and in 2015, Professor Portelli was awarded the prestigious Dan David Prize for his extraordinary work over the last three decades in linking oral history and collective memory completely changing and enriching the way we look at history in the past. With his research, Professor Portelli has transformed the way <coughs> subjectivity and history coalesce to form meaning. Uh, there's a lot more I could say about Professor Portelli, but I think it's time for us to welcome him and to thank him for being here. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've uh, only been in this town for like a couple of hours, but I <laughs> kind of like it. It's <laughs> love. <laughs> okay, that's what I used to say about my hometown there. I went back and spent 20 years researching its history. Uh, you never can tell what's underneath the surface of daily life. And this is one of the reasons I'm here, after all, because um, 
the, um, the work of oral history and the work of, uh, of folk, um, of folklore uh, have been used very much in the past, have been defined very much um, as ways of dealing with the past, with, um, uh, well, with, <coughs> with roots and with, uh, uh, and with memory as a, um, as a receptacle of past events. Uh, what uh, I have tried to do, and what uh, this uh, circle of uh, activist uh, scholars that I work with in Italy has tried to do, is to point out that um, you interview somebody uh, about, say, World War II. So the conversation takes is about World War II, but it's but it happens in the present. So that um, the, um, the oral history interview, the oral history narrative is both a document that gives us some information about the past, but implicitly or explicitly, it tells us where we are at right now, what we remember, what it means, so that um, it becomes um, a way of dealing with uh, um, what is, relevant, what is meaningful to us in our time, and what is our relationship to the past. The same with uh, folklore. Uh, I began to um, try to collect folk songs around Central Italy, around Rome, uh, primarily because I was persuaded, and I was not the only one, uh, that they were uh, an important um, source uh, for the um, an important form of self-expression for what we used to call the non-hegemonic classes, that is, uh, the non-ruling classes, the working class, uh, the rural poor women in many ways, and, um, and therefore they became um, one way of investigating the, uh, what we used to call the culture of class struggle. What, uh, who controls history? Who, um, who decides what is to remember? And who has a voice? And I pretty soon found out that uh, everybody has a voice. And this very paternalistic idea that we are giving voice to the, to the voiceless is wrong, like all paternalistic ideas. We are. Um, we are receiving voice from people who have not, who have a voice but have not been heard. Uh, so, what we are offering by doing this kind of work is a listening, um, not a voice. As a matter of fact, uh, if uh, I'm getting, I'm receiving voice from uh, many, many people that I've uh, had the opportunity to to listen to. So. Uh, the project that I wanted to tell you a little bit about then, uh, so we don't know each other, so uh, maybe <coughs> we can later have some conversation so that I, you know, if there are things that I have that interest you more than what I'm going to say, uh, we can talk about them. But anyway, uh, the project that I've been talking about uh, is a project on uh, the uh, music of immigrants in Rome. Now, this um, uh, this has to do with a huge change in the uh, identity of Italian society. Because when I was growing up, but until the say the early 80s, Italy was only a country of immigrants, and Canada as its share. Um, <coughs> we are still a country of immigrants, um, although it's mainly ed educated um, people now that migrate. Um, but we have also become, in the uh, since the uh, last maybe 30 years, a country of immigration. A very complicated uh, process because um, Italy is, of course, the closest point to 
Libya, uh, Tunisia. Uh, it's an easy point of arrival from the Middle East. And, uh, uh, and we had a huge influx of people from Romania, from the Ukraine for the last few years. So suddenly we have this, uh, this presence. And uh, not everyone with us. We have uh, seen the rise of xenophobic, racist, um, not only uh, organizations, political parties, uh, but uh, the, the rise of uh, a racist discourse in our society, which we thought uh, we were exempted. Uh, the reason we didn't have a racist an openly racist discourse and it was simply that we had no races to uh, discriminate against. But now we have that opportunity and we're catching up with the rest of the <laughs> And uh, um, even though, of course, Italy has a, man, a history of racism in its colonial adventures uh, in which serious crimes against humanity were committed and in the racist laws against that began as racist laws against Africans, and then, of course, became the uh, racist laws against Jews and prepared Italy's complicity with the Shoah. So this influx of migrants is a complicated uh, process. And, um, and I'm not saying it's a gallant dinner. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we are um, receiving an influence, for one thing, of very young people in a society that is getting older and older. And um, people who, by definition, are multilingual, people who uh, are brave enough to uh, risk uh, death and dangers by crossing the Mediterranean, which uh, is, uh, is now um, open air grave of thousands of uh, migrants. <coughs> the, um, the idea of um, collecting the music of migrants, however, comes from another, it's not just because you know, one wishes to prove that this influence of people uh, has, that they bring some culture with them, that they bring things of beauty, uh, and also that they have to say things to say, to talk about, to say about us. But it comes from uh, another uh, direction, which is, uh, well, most, uh, one of the theoretical problems with folklore has always been, is there folklore in the city? Is there such a thing as an urban folklore? And, uh, you know, the, the whole tradition that I come from had problems finding folklore in the city. So that a lot of the uh, folk music that we collected came from mostly rural areas, even though uh, it was very timely and very topical. Yet, you know, um, if you're looking for uh, uh, child ballads in uh, the Fiat factory, you won't find them. Um, so, uh, this was, so th <coughs> is there music in the city? Is there folklore in the city? And the other thing was uh, that um, it's kind of related to this. Um, I, w I had an uncle who was a musician, a songwriter, all, all his life he only had one hit. And, <laughs> but that particular, the song is still remembered. And the song says, uh, addresses Ninetta, which is a common young woman's name in Rome. And she says, do you remember the good old times when in the streets you could always hear some kind of music, an, uh, an accordion, or uh, somebody, uh, you know, women singing? Uh, what happened? There's no music left in the town because Everybody has fallen in love. The song was dates to 1949. Everybody has fallen in love with this foreign music, which was, of course, American music on the radio and everything. 
So that the idea that there, that one of the reasons why there's no music in the streets in Rome was that well, Maria uh, Maria Laura Mosco for, uh, forgot to add that my latest book is a book of Bruce Springsteen. So, <laughs> so we've been swamped by uh, by this foreign uh, American music, and we love it. But um, uh, and then I, you know, I started noticing that no, there is music in the streets. There is music in the subways. There's music on the on the trams. There's music in the, a number of religious places, and it's musica forestiera. It's a foreigner's music. The foreigners have brought the music back to the streets of our city. And uh, so investigating this music means, uh, number one, uh, well, having second thoughts about the idea of folklore as roots. Because what this music proves is that folklore has wings, the folklore has feet, the music travels uh, all over uh, all over the world. Uh, one file which I have in the no, but I can't find it. It's too hard to find. Um, I might try later. But it's this Chinese lady, uh, the mother of a child in a element in a elementary school in Rome, um, and uh, so part of the project was going to these schools where they have. 40% uh, children of uh, foreign parents, and asking the parents, what songs do you know? So we asked her, do you, do you know any children's songs? And she sang a typical Chinese New Year's uh, song to the air of Oh My Darling Clementine, <laughs> which clearly, <laughs> so you have in Rome a Chinese lady singing a, uh, a Chinese song to an American so this tells you that the idea that the very conservative, very reactionary idea that folklore uh, is uh, the is where your unchanging and unchangeable identity resides, which is the way folklore was used by fascism, by Nazism, uh, occasionally in the in the Soviet Union, but with a little bit more sophistication. Uh, what we're seeing is now. Folklore is global. Folklore is universal. Um, one of the songs that uh, you hear occasionally, one of the very ancient songs that you hear in uh, in the repertoire of some traditional singers in Italy, north and south, is uh, a song uh, which we call the uh, the, the Poison Man's Testament. Which is Lord Randall. I don't know if you know the song, the, you know, the English, Scottish, Irish, North American song, Lord Randall, uh, and which is about this man who's been poisoned by his girlfriend and then uh, makes testament. And uh, it's a very complex, a very fascinating song. It sung in southern Italy, in Louisiana, in Aberdeen, in. Uh, and I also found on the web a Canadian-French version. With, so, uh, so is this regional? Is this local? Is this roots? Or is this wings? Is this, uh, because the immateriality of culture means that culture um, uh, can fly over borders, over boundaries. And still, when people travel uh, across boundaries, transatlantically, they carry uh, culture and music with them. So this is basically you know, the methodological, if we want to call it that way, uh, approach. The other thing where, um, where I'm glad to be doing this today is that uh, only about a week ago, um, on October 3rd, we celebrated the uh, Second, the third anniversary of the first major disaster in uh, the uh, Mediterranean crossing 
300 um, migrants, mostly from Eritrea, refugees from Eritrea, died in a ship that sunk. And um, so that day has become a, sort of a, the unofficial day of remembering the tragedies that accompany immigration and thinking about our attitude toward it. There have been similar massacres, similar disasters since then. But so we sort of celebrated on the, uh, on the third day of October. And I would like, and I would like to start, um, play a little, uh, like 15 second piece. Uh, to also remind you that most people come come to Italy not because they want to stay, but because they want to go elsewhere. Um, you know, migration in Italy is worldwide. Families scatter because they have relatives in France, they have relatives in England, because they've heard that things are better in Sweden. Um, so uh, a lot of these people, their plan is to cross Italy. Now, the European Union, which uh, has made travel free for all European citizens uh, and money, uh, and, uh, same currency and everything, has suddenly rediscovered foreigners. So, uh, and the idea is that uh, migrants are supposed to stay in the first country in which they enter the European Union. These people don't want to stay in Italy. They, they, they went to France. So this thing, um, number one, was recorded on the rocks of Ventimiglia. Ventimiglia is a town on the coast, uh, on the French border. These are mainly young Eritrean refugees who are trying to get, to get into France. And then maybe through Calais uh, to England or whatever. And the French police stopped them. And uh, so they camped on the, literally on the, on the rocks for two months until last week they were kicked out by the police. Um, they had a lot of support from local people, churches, groups, but, so there was a lot of solidarity, but ultimately the Italian state and the French state decided that uh, they could not, they could neither cross nor stay. And this is what they uh, chanted on those rocks. chanting is, we are not going back. We are not going back. You go to certain churches and and you hear singing in uh, uh, like Sunday night, there's a huge Brazilian celebration in Rome, and there's supposed to be a lot of singing. So I began to see that maybe it was actually possible. And then a couple of things happened. Uh, I was um, going to work, I usually drive to work. That day I decided I would be ecologically correct, and I took the bus and the subway. I took the train, a bus, a subway, and a bus to go to work. And, uh, but as I was coming out of the subway station, there were these two wonderful Ecuadorian musicians singing, uh, singing the whole realm of Latin American music. And uh, uh, so this was, uh, gave me a sense that maybe it was possible. Then, uh, and then I have this friend, uh, because before I did, I, I worked with the music, I had started out a journal uh, dedicated to African, to what I called Afro-Italian literature, to the writing of immigrants in <coughs> Italy, in Italian. And one of my 
one of my friends who's a writer, uh, Christina Alifara, wrote a newspaper article once when, and she said, um, she talked about uh, teaching in, a, in an independent movement-oriented activist school of Italian for, for foreigners. And she said, uh, one, of the, um, one of the students has written a song in which he talks about his immigration experience. So I thought, so it's happening. It is happening. Uh, and it took us a couple of months before we found them, because, as I always say, migrants migrate. And, uh, and also, they, they don't have steady jobs. Uh, and, and so sometimes, uh, in fact, we, we lost track of him again, and they owe him money. Yes. And, <laughs> but, uh, and, Anyway, that, is it working now? Yes. Okay, let's, let's try. Uh, we're not going back with uh, as a way of uh, paying homage to these people. structure of African music and African American music. You know, we don't we only do that in church at mass, but not by, not by singing. Uh, so this is a, a bit of you know, uh, African culture. And I say African because they come from most of them are Eritrean, but they come from different parts of Africa. In fact they they are not using an African language, they're, they're <coughs> chanting in the common language which is English. So anyway uh, we uh, started looking for the, uh, for this man, and finally we located him. And this is what we recorded, and it's number five. Istaraniri is a way in which uh, a Somali person pronounces the word stranieri, which means foreigners in Italian. So that already tells you that there's contamination going on, no? Hayo, stranieri va na hayo, Italia no spica hayo. Italia no spica hayo. Italia no hayo, stranieri va na hayo, Italia no spica hayo. And what the song says, we are Barto Afka. We have left a place where we were obsessed with the and And then he says, uh, uh, he says, okay, so now we, um, uh, we are hospitating. Hospitating uh, is the Italian word that means both host and guest. So we are guests in this country. But where are we? Uh, am I European? Am I African? What am I now? And uh, the uh, um, so I was so proud that uh, here's the evidence that uh, you know the missing link exists. The migrants are singing about migration in Italy. And I I had the opportunity to attend a conference in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, uh, on what they call the Black Mediterranean, uh, the, you know, you know the, uh, the books on the Black Atlantic, the Black Mediterranean, the migration across the Mediterranean, then there was a World Cup on uh, Somali migration to Italy, so I very proudly played the state. I and Christina, my writer friend, was there, and we Proudly played the state. And uh, Nuruddin Farah, Nuruddin Farah is a great Somali writer, uh, Nobel Prize candidate, wonderful, nice person. He got up and said, This is horrible. It's horrible because you know, Somali poetry is uh, 
one of the most oral poetry in Somalia is one of the most sophisticated art forms in the world. It's really highly sophisticated and highly complicated. And he says, this man is ignorant. He knows nothing about meter. He doesn't knows nothing about uh, alliteration. This is terrible. Uh, and of course, you know, you're sort of taken aback. This is your most prized recording. And, uh, uh, but then uh, he had, uh, uh, in, in his presentation, he had said uh, about the gifts of migration. He said, well, after all, one of the gifts of migration is you can actually uh, eat good food even in London. Very <laughs> And uh, so uh, that gave me you know, the way out. I told him, look, because it occurred to me that um, uh, I was at a place in Winnipeg called uh, the Old Spaghetti Factory. And uh, I don't know. what I spoke is unspeakable. What I ate is unspeakable from the point of view of Italian cuisine. <laughs> it was decent Canadian food. <laughs> well, I ate it. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I told Nuruddin, look, this may be very bad Somali poetry, but it's very important Italian song. I said, you're right, you're right. So the other thing that uh, this teaches us is most uh, uh, migration studies, most multicultural studies have been carried out in terms of heritage, survivals of uh, uh, the cultural baggage of the old world. What, what Italian traditions survive in Canada? Uh, and things like that. Uh, what we should look at is the fact that all, the, all migrants migrated from different parts of the world, from Nigeria, from the Ukraine. But they <coughs> all came to the same place, dealt with the same bureaucracy, with the same uh, discrimination and racism. Uh, and they have in common, you know, no matter how different they are, they have in common the fact that uh, they all have the experience of having to leave home and making their way to a foreign country. So if we look at uh, multiculturalism from the point of view of arrival, we see that it tells you a lot less about where they come from than it does about where they arrive. And in this case, uh, there's a, a very, very uh, powerful where he says, we are guests. Uh, there are three Italian words in the song, pronounced the way he does. Ospita guest. Titolo uh, Viaggio, which is a document, a paper they give you um, that allows you for a given time to travel around the country. And Permesso uh, di Soggiorno, which is paper that says this person is legally uh, allowed to stay here. So the key word is hospital. Because when we, when we think of guests, you know, uh, it's a word that makes us feel real good about ourselves. You know, it's, uh, in, uh, in Germany, in Switzerland, Italian migrants are called Gastarbeiters, uh, guest workers. You know. But from his point of view, being against means that this is not and will never be his home. That he will never be allowed to be other than to be there other than of tolerance and to be a guest. And we have a proverb in Italy that says that after three the guests are like fish. After three days they stink. So uh, you know guest is a very, very uh, ambivalent and complicated word. He also, in, in the interview we did, he says, well, when the Italians came to Somalia, uh, they, were, they were our guests, and to us, a guest is sacred, so they became, uh, they finally be, uh, became the masters here, uh, and they turned us into guests in our, in our own country. 
So one of the great things that this does is it turns the uh, meaning, it changes the meaning of our words uh, when they're spoken from a different point of view and from another perspective. And uh, a word of self-complacency, we are receiving these people as guests in, in our country, means they'll never be their country. They will never be accepted entirely. They will never be citizens. So, uh, one of the, I remember uh, uh, a, guitar, a Romanian guitar player on, on a bus singing uh, an Italian pop song about being a vagabondo. And it's, a, it's one of those songs that says, oh, it's wonderful to be a vagabond, a roamer, a traveler, no house. And then the person I was singing was a real vagabond. And perhaps you know, he wasn't as happy as, uh, as a song made So uh, by the very fact that our language is being uh, perpetrated and reimagined from this other point of view, we get another view of ourselves. Um, it's another um, another example of what happens uh, on the, the kind of transformation that uh, the, in the immigration experience brings in the in the very cultural baggage that people bring with them. Uh, I'll tell you the word. Okay, I'm. Uh, I was going to this town on the Adriatic coast, uh, Porto San Giorgio, for a conference. I dropped at the hotel to leave my bags, and there's this man uh, um, mopping the floor and singing in Tagalog, which is the language of the Philippines. So I say, could I record you? And he says, yeah, of course. And all his co-workers said, oh, yeah, he sings all the time. Please, please do. No, no, he said, Britannia. So we, they actually uh, closed off a room so that we could record and everything. He started singing, and he couldn't do it. He just kept breaking down in tears. So I said, uh, OK, let's forget it. Um, he said, no, 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 no. Uh, you caught me unawares, I'm prepared. Uh, let's meet again tomorrow morning, and I'll sing. So we met the next day, and he sang. And uh, it's number <coughs> 12. And he sings in a very subdued voice. are uh, a sign of the fact that these are not fully authorized voices. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to sing. Anyway, what the song does, the song says, uh, Dear son, do you remember uh, how much your parents loved you? What a joy it was for us when you were born. We were freely given our life for you. We love you so much. Your dad. You're the sunshine of our lives. He has a child, he has a son back in the Philippines that he hasn't seen for eight years. However, this song, uh, he said, well, th this this is a popular song in the Philippines. It's by uh, Freddy Aguilar, who's a rock star in the Philippines, um, and uh, and it's by him. And uh, so. What I thought, what I did was, I went on uh, YouTube and located the Fred Aguilar performance and the text and translation. And uh, Fred Aguilar's song has two verses. The first is the one that he sang about the love of uh, parents for a child. The second is, so we, and no, so now why do you rebel against us? Why do you, why, what have we done wrong? Why are you so hostile to us? So what he's done, by simply forgetting or leaving out 
the second verse, has been to turn a song about generational conflict into a, and you know the ingratitude of children into a song of uh, a migrant's nostalgia for his lost child. And this is a typical process of folklore. Usually the final verses are forgotten because people don't always get to sing the whole song, but also because you forget what, if you remember, you forget selectively. And you remember what has meaning for you and you leave out what uh, disturbs you. So in this case, the uh, in the first case, uh, the Somali young man, Yusuf Gedi, uh, he has created a new piece in uh, his own language about the migrant experience. In this case, Camilo Gospincio, he has uh, changed subtly uh, a song that he brought from home to infuse it with new meaning uh, derived from his migrant experience. Then there are also some, uh, we have still have about 10 minutes, don't we? Uh, uh, there are also some success stories. Not success in the sense that people made, well, some people even got rich, but in the sense that uh, integration is achieved. And, um, and this is, uh, the example that I want to play is by um, this man from Punjab, India. Uh, his name is Jajit Rai Mehta. And Jajit uh, lives in, uh, um, uh, in a town in northern Italy, um, Piadena, which is a dairy region. It's near Parma. So that's where Parmigiano comes from. And and he works in, on a dairy farm with cows, which, of course, has a, a whole different meaning for somebody who's a Hindu. And, uh, so, and he talks about, he has a personal relationship with some of them, and when he feeds them, it's like feeding his children. But what, is, uh, what makes it different, different from, from uh, J.D.? The Somali boy. Somali boy is alone. He has no regular job. Uh, he left his family at home. And in fact, he has another song where he said, which is a dialogue between the husband who migrated and the woman who stayed at home. And she says, "Why don't you come see me?" And he says, "I can't, because if I uh, if I leave this country, then I can't get back in again." And she says, "You've sold yourself for a bottle of uh, Italian wine." And so you know, even the sense of guilt uh, in, uh, in having migrated and the people you left home. Now, Jajit has his family with him. He is now an Italian citizen. His wife also has a job. His two children are graduating from high school. And he kind of, because he's a citizen, he can go back and visit his family. And uh, in fact, he takes friends from Piadera back to India to be his guests. You know? and, uh, um, and he has uh, joined um, a, a, an incredible grassroots organization they have in Piadena, which is a culture league created by dairy farm workers, uh, uh, construction workers. And, it's, a, it, and it, it's an organization that has done a lot of work on singing, on retrieving the, and keeping alive the the power of song. So he decided at some point that he also wanted to sing. His wife said, over my dead body. <laughs> <laughs> he did anyway. And he sings this song in Italian, but the chanting is the chanting that his father uses when he sings in the temple in Punjab. And, uh, and <coughs> in the CD, uh, I use the song as number two because it's a direct response to the we're not going back of the Eritrean migrants. And then translated as, uh, as it goes. <laughs> I come from far away. I'm not, I'm not going away. 
I was born in Miami, where my mother lives. Siamo otto There's only eight brothers of us. Tutti dati we all live. Una vive Canada. One lives in Canada. <laughs> in Three in England. Quattro in Italia. Tutti dati via. We all live. Vengo da lontano. I come I talk homesick. I do hard work. I do dirty work. I work in the stable. I live in the country. Dove urla non vi temi. Cows and cows scream. And chickens and owls sing. That is my house. I'm not going to I'm not going Anima mia, my soul, tutto questo bella vita mia. all this is my beautiful life. Mm-hmm. All right, so this is a, almost a, sounds a, almost like a direct answer to the Somali song. This is my house. I live here. And, but the reason why he cannot, can say that he's not homesick is because he is not cut off from his hometown. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the second song um, by Yusuf, he says, you know, in order to come back to see you, I have to cut off my arm because they're, finger, they're fingerprinted when they enter the country. I would have to cut off my arm. So the, it's literally like you know, when you migrate, you cut off a piece of yourself uh, to make a, what could be a very long story, a little bit shorter. Uh, uh, when we were, we were just beginning on, to work on this project, um, one of my we had we had a, a conference and uh, migrants came who had written about their story, had been, uh, or we brought in some of the musicians, and but probably the most. Um, meaningful moment came when uh, one Italian folk singer got up and sang a very soulful version of the Italian migrant song, which which is on the computer, but it's hard to read, so well, no, 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 it's not on this file, it's, uh, I, could, I could find it, but it takes time. Anyway, the song says, uh, the song has two parts, and the first part is uh, uh, the, the girl says, Mama, would you give me a hundred lire so that I can go to America? And the mama says, you can have a hundred lire, but no, no, don't go to America. And the brothers from the window say, Mama, let her go. And she says, all right, you can go, but you'll be cursed, and I hope you die in the sea. So this is the Italian migrant song. And I lately discovered that there are songs that Italian immigrants have composed. Uh, I don't know about Canada, but in Brazil they sing this great song about you know, crossing the ocean, and then we have built, with the, with the work of us Italians, uh, we have built towns and cities and everything, you know, the pride and what they've accomplished. But the songs of the people who stayed home are songs about betrayal. You left, and you left us alone. Uh, my favorite one, there are more, there's more than one, there are several, but my favorite one is, uh, she says, my husband went to America and he's not driving. I wonder what I've done wrong. Maybe the thing I've done wrong is that he left me one son and now I have seven. So <laughs> 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 surprised for her for, you know, leaving her and not driving. So, uh, so the first part of this is about you know, the sense of being abandoned and uh, betrayed and the curse. So the second part is, of course, uh, halfway on the ocean, the ship sinks and she dies. And there are uh, 
verse after verse about each part of her body devoured by fish in the sea. Now, just a week before we did that, uh, a migrant ship had sunk in the Mediterranean, and uh, one very disgraceful uh, racist politician said, uh, maybe for a while we shouldn't eat tuna fish because the bodies have been eaten by fish in the Mediterranean. And um, so when she sang that song, we always concentrated on the first part, <coughs> on, the, on the curse and the, and the death. But when she sang that song, we suddenly realized that for the migrants, it was the second part of the world. The experience of dying at sea, the uh, unmaking of the body in the sea, and it was, some of us might have some uh, T.S. Eliot quotes from the wayside about this, you know, death by water. And, uh, and, but, um, so that even uh, our own culture, our own traditions, change meanings. Traditions always change meaning. This is one of the huge misunderstandings in, in, in folklore studies, the idea that folklore uh, represents uh, a stable identity once forever and always means the same thing. No. A tradition, you know, the word tradition means passing on. And when you pass things on, you know, they change. And in this case, our traditions also change meaning because you see people are moments. And they're going through stories very much like ours in different ways, but their story is a judgment on ours. So I think this is a good moment for me to stop. Uh, there's a, a, a saying in Rome that describes me uh, that says, there are people that it takes five cents to start them and a hundred dollars to stop them. <laughs> so you have to stop and collect the hundred dollars. And we still have comments, questions, and other things that you'd like to talk about. That's what I'm here for. Thank you. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting here between lines. I, I you talk about the non-hegemonic classes. Yes. Uh, an allusion to Gramsci, right. obviously. Yes. So are you theoretically situating this music as a form of resistance, class resistance? Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, in his writing on folklore, Gramsci uh, defined folklore as the cultural expression of the non-hegemonic classes. That is, he connects folklore with class, uh, which does not automatically mean that its contents are contents of resistance. I mean, I got dozens of uh, love songs and uh, things like that. But the element of resistance, I would say, is in the fact that these songs exist. And therefore, individuals who are not included in the official public record have stories, have voices. So this is not necessarily an element of active, intentional, political resistance. It's more like a sign that um, uh, there are bodies and voices in society that are not included and not entirely controlled by the general. That's the, I wouldn't go any farther than that. Uh, that's the we're not going back is clearly a song of resistance. Um, but um, others are simply ways of, uh, of reminding the uh, bearers of the woman dominant culture, the white male, and we'll say white male uh, European professors, uh, that we're not universal, that our culture is partial, that there's something else out there. And sometimes, you know, that something else encroaches our little cozy present. 
Um, that's basically the, what I would say. I would not claim that, because you see, uh, the other, I have a sense that, especially now that the left wing it has been wiped out all over Europe. Uh, class struggle is still going on. And not only uh, in ter on the one side, in terms of you know, the give backs and the, uh, the loss of work workers' rights, uh, even of women's rights in many places. But so the, because you know it takes two to do in a class struggle, and uh, and the uh, and the rulers also struggle against the rulers. But the real form of class struggle in the world today is migration. Because if class struggle is uh, the poor wanting the rich to share, uh, that's what it is. So they're coming over. Uh, everybody says, how come they're not going to China? Of course they're not going to China. Uh, there's a lot of money in the West. Um, and uh, so, but the, the difference now is that while the traditional form of class struggle, communism, I still call myself one uh, with a number of uh, quotes, quotes around it. Uh, aim to tear down the system. This form of class struggle, because it has to do with class, these people are poor, it is a struggle, so I'll call it that, does not aim to tear down the system, but to join it. However, no matter how we think of ourselves as generous of, of our democracy as universal, they're proving that we're not generous, that we're not universal, and that our democracy is based on the exclusion of the majority of mankind. So, so maybe they are tearing down our system, even though they love it. I want to thank you for your comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I want to thank you for your presentation. Thank you. You, uh, you, you sound like a very kind and compassionate man. Well, and I when you very well. <laughs> <laughs> when you acknowledged what your political affiliation is, it confirmed the reason why. I am um, from Trinidad, right. and uh, the folklore music that I think of is the Calypso. Yeah, which is protest. <laughs> which is protest, and a friend of mine described the Calypso as the archive of the poor man. Yes. When you want to know what's going on politically, what sexual scandals, what this, that's where you go. But I want to follow up on the, the question here related to Gramsci, because the, the Calypsonian is, in my mind, a traditional intellectual who can Thank you. <laughs> Who can be made to operate as an organic intellectual. And the politicians are very mindful of the power of that popular word. So they try to enlist the Calypsonian on their side to propagate their message. And some Calypsonians, you work for five cents to $100. Some Calypsonians would do it, but today for big money. And uh, so I just wanted you to comment on that. And one more, because I talk with my Italian friends quite often about this, the way in which race can complicate class and the class struggle. And you describe yourself as a white European male. I want you to tell me how I can tell my Italian friends, when did Italians become white? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Because, of course, number one, okay, both things. The, um, the Calypsonian is organic intellectual. Um, there's an article by uh, Pete Peterson, a sociologist from uh, what's the university Vanderbilt in Nashville, and he writes of, of country singers as organic intellectuals. Um, you know the, the country singers like uh, Sarah Hogan, uh, you know those who were actually Hazel Dickens. So. Uh, because I think there's been a huge uh, and partly intentional misunderstanding in the uh, official left over the meaning of the term organic intellectual. Uh, I'm not an organic intellectual. Uh, I'm a camp follower. 
And um, an organic intellectual is the intellectual that is that's front. I think Gramsci's phrase, oh, it's so refreshing to be here and hear people refer to Gramsci because he's so out of public discourse in Italy. You know, uh, so it's great, thank you. Um, the, um, uh, he said it springs from the masses. Right? And, um, uh, and you know, the, the movement that, I've, um, that I think of myself as part of, the cultural movement, um, devised this idea of the upside down intellectual, which is, maybe this is what I endeavor to be, which is, uh, the uh, the uh, organic intellectual according to the leadership of the Communist Party, which incidentally I never joined, um, is uh, somebody who teaches the masses because he's he, he's a bearer of culture and he has a right part. Uh, the um, the upside down intellectual, as described by my mentor Gianni Bosio, uh, that we formed the organization named after him is somebody who primarily learns from the masses, then does the work of the intellectual. You, you don't take it at face value. Uh, you work on it. You do critical work. You do philological work on it. You take it to a different level of awareness and organization, and then you return it back. Okay. So uh, this idea of the upside down intellectual, not very popular or well known, but this I think is what has inspired me. When did Italians become white? Uh, uh, we Italians don't usually think of ourselves as white. We think of ourselves as human by default. So I'll tell you a little story because it's, uh, you know, you know, stories are always much better than abstract. So I had, I'm teaching African American authors. I, taught a course on Richard Wright, native son. So here comes this young woman. She passed us the exam with flying colors. <coughs> Brilliant. And then she says, you know, Professor, I just got engaged to an African boy. So she wanted to show that her heart was in the right place. I said, good. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I would have said congratulations to anybody to that being <laughs> Congratulations. So she says, the other day, uh, he came to dinner and I introduced him to my parents. Guess who's coming to dinner? To <laughs> and, and I said, how did it go? Great. They loved each other very much. They, it was a great success. Um, they just took to each other very much and, uh, and everything was well. Then uh, my father walked into the door when he, when he left. Say goodbye, hugged him, and everything. Close the door, turned back to me, and looked. Wonderful boy. However, now, however, it's a key word of Italian racism. <laughs> however, they are a race, we are not. So we're not white. We are human. And it's all, you know, all the uh, racist jokes and stories of the fascist theorists was never white versus black, but Italian versus Negro. So, and the, on the other hand, do you consider this man a racist? Because what used to be the test? Would you let your daughter marry one? He is letting his daughter marry one. Did you want peace with him? So it's not, it's, it's not even racism. It's just that we assume that we are normal. So, and we have all this other discourse on the other, otherness, as if we weren't the other to someone else. Anyway, Italians. Uh, when I'm at it. Um, I'm a visiting professor at the University of Kentucky. I have my family with me. So I enrolled my son in, in the second grade. Because I'm the professor from Rome, the principal invites me to his office and, uh, and we fill the forms. And we fill the forms, age, uh, race. He says, white, I guess. <laughs> and I said, I don't really know, because as Malcolm X said in one of his final speeches, what do you think 
uh, Hannibal's African troops were doing in southern Italy uh, <laughs> when they occupied it for a number of years. Said, Why do Italians have dark, dark skin and curly hair? And, uh, and so there's a, there's a very popular rap group from Naples, because since a lot of discrimination of prejudice in Italy goes north versus south, so a lot of people in the south are proudly identified with them, themselves with Africa. So there's a, uh, this popular rap group from Naples that has this hit song that says, we are the children, the children of Hannibal. And so, and, uh, and my family is from Sicily. I mean, the, the Arabs ruled Sicily for 800 years, and they forget about it. And, uh, but, uh, one of the great things that W.B. Du Bois says in his autobiography uh, is there's no, nobody is only one thing. And he talks about his heritage from Corsica. From the, so uh, this whole idea of whiteness is uh, a fiction. Uh, uh, one of the very earliest uh, African testimonies on slavery, the autobiography of Olavo de Piano, uh, 1785. Uh, and Olavo de Piano is probably, as far as I know, the first African description of the encounter with Europeans. And he says, I was terrified that I was going to be eaten by those red-skinned ghosts. Red. That's, you know, that's the kind of sense in the mirror. There's no white. You know? But we, we say white because we uh, identify, because it means an absence of color. That is, it means normal. And all the others, you know, say white and color, <laughs> colored. Except we don't see our, our color as a color. So, and uh, anyway, in Louisiana, uh, the farms used to uh, classify the farmhands in three groups, Negroes, Italians, and whites. And uh, so, uh, well, there's a, there's a book that says, when, the Irish, when did the Irish become white? Uh, and the Jews is, uh, it doesn't exist. It's something that, uh, uh, you attribute to yourself and attribute it to yourself as a sign of uh, privilege, I guess. Yes. <coughs> I'd like to come back to, to your take on folklore yeah. and the double voice that you're invoking. Not only to have a voice as uh, Hegelian recognition, but also to voice it. Um, and things are going well until they fear to let. I don't know how they fear to let. Maybe the, the stereo system goes better to the left. So my question is this. In your studies, uh, what is the function of the self-representation of the voice singing in Ventimiglia or in Roma uh, when we know fully well that for most people uh, transiting from a place to another whether you are migrating or running away or exiling yourself, the moment of the crossing becomes the fundamental experience of the new life. And you are going to put jokes and memoirs and poems and especially music into that particular moment. And when you do that, uh, as we know people usually do, that becomes a song, that becomes the formula or the open sesame to the new world or the second part of one's world. Uh, and it becomes not only automatic, it becomes ritualistic, and especially self-representative. So to what extent the songs that you are mentioning here and you have encountered in your studies are not formulaic first, and then they have maybe some genuineness? To them. Uh, I would not make the distinction between formulaic and genuine. Uh, I would think that formulaic is one of the forms, it's a, it's a genuine form of self-representation. Um, and not only, I'm now thinking of uh, uh, 
the Lord and Perry theory of uh, uh, oral composition, where the formulae allows you to speak, and uh, uh, and in fact somehow uh, the fact that you have set rules and limits on uh, uh, on how your on what is speakable and how it is speakable help you. A little story. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a great tradition in central Italy of improvised poetry, uh, which is improvised and sung in a complex meter, which is a meter, same meter as the Chinaric poets of uh, the Renaissance, the eight lines that's and uh, this tradition is carried on by mainly uh, shepherds, uh, but uh, in this town of Cinta Vecchia, Cinta Vecchia is a harbor town just north of Rome, uh, the, because they're close to uh, the animal, the cattle raising and shepherd traditions, it's right back to behind them. A lot of um, dog workers also improvise. Now, it just so happened that uh, the local communist cell had been taken over by intellectuals, by people like me, who knew how to talk, and therefore silenced the workers. Because the workers had no, couldn't compete with how well these people talked. And they felt silenced. Until one day, one dog worker got up, and he made a long intervention in Otavan. Uh, that is the difficulty, the formulae, the meter, the rhyme, which apparently are you know, a limitation, are what allowed them to speak. And also to challenge the intention, go ahead and try and do it again. I can do it. Uh, I've learned from them. Uh, so, in a way, the, uh, the genre, the structure, uh, are, uh, you know, Italo Calvino talks of a narrative as a garden of crossing paths, but paths, uh, not, not as open grounds where anything goes, but a ground which, where you have paths. So this is one thing. The other thing is uh, self-representation tells you a lot about how people are, about the, um, the things that comes to mind is uh, Walker Evans, the uh, freshman year photographer, yes, this, uh, this fantastic book, uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, where James Agee describes the experience of living with uh, tenant farmers uh, in Alabama, and Walker Evans takes photographs. They're all post photographs. They're not snapshots, intentionally. Because what these people want to be seen as tells you a great deal about what they are. And you know, one one basic thing in oral history or in folklore and anthropology, you don't take the self-representation at face value. You take it critically anyway. So you try to read through it to what's behind it. I got into oral history the day I realized that 80% of the stories I was hearing from workers in my hometown about certain events were wrong. And, uh, uh, and I became fascinated at why are they making this change? So uh, self-representation is a space of desire, uh, of, uh, uh, basically a space of desire. And what people desire uh, is part of who they are, so in a way, yes. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, ritualistic also tells you that, uh, of course, they're speaking for themselves. And they are speaking through forms that have been uh, uh, created socially. And, and indeed, they speak, speak thanks to the fact that these forms have been socially created. So that uh, the fact that 
uh, they can speak for themselves because they have a whole so society behind them. This, I think, applies to everyone. Uh, I once saw a sign in a bookstore in Harlem after Tony Morrison won the Nobel Prize that said, thank you, Tony, our beloved. So I had the opportunity to interview Tony Morrison because there's a whole uh, controversy in African American literature where black writers say, I don't want to be taken as you representative of anyone and speak for myself. So I asked Tony and said, what, what does, uh, our, how do you react to that, our beloved? And she said, of course. Only reason I can write is because generations and generations have created the conditions where I can do it. So we're always in at, at a crossroads between the, the social, the collective, the inherited, and the new. Um, after all, one of the fascinating things in folklore, uh, nobody can sing a song and tell a story exactly the same way twice. And nobody can sing a song and tell a song. They'll tell you, this is the way my ancestors told it. No. This is not the way your ancestors told it. This is the way you think your ancestors told it. And this is the way you're telling it. So if you're thinking of this uh, folklore as a living process in the present, uh, you see the change going on. And you see how the individual impulse in the shared tradition uh, subtly changes it. And my mouth open so I go on. Um, they, uh, you know, the, 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 this long uh, uh, about distinction in social and linguistics. Uh, you know, long is a code that enables each of us to do our individual acts of Pavo. Uh, however, our individual acts of Pavo reflect back on the long, they change it. The code changes, is changed by the way we use it. So I think, uh, uh, yes, there is a great deal of formulaic and there's a great deal of ritual, but um, um, I think if you make an effort to read, uh, to read, uh, well, I'm trying to, not to say to read through it, because it would mean that, you know, it's only, a, it's something to read the ritual and the formulae in uh, uh, more in depth, then you will also find that they are both uh, boundaries and uh, enablements. I, I don't know if this is what you have in mind. Yes. Um, I think that so thank you for your presentation. I found a couple points interesting. Can you speak a little bit about this? Sure, I can. Um, you alluded to the role of colonialism um, in playing a part in the way current narratives are shaped in terms of racist discourses. But I find it interesting because aren't some of the inadvertent effects of colonialism, especially with regards to Eritrea and looking at Libya and some of the entrance points to Italy, um, historically rooted, like in the sense that there's been a long influence of Italian cultural penetration. Like, I mean, people remain long. Italians remain within those regions long after colonialism ended and have influenced a cultural, I guess, to a certain degree, some sort of narrative or connection. Um, so my question to you is, when you're talking about the Somali example um, and talking about the meaning of guests, there's also interpretation of history at play in the way these songs are written and the reasons for why migrants come to particular places. Can you maybe speak and elaborate a little bit more on some of the nuances of the ways in which colonialism has influenced these narratives? Well, uh, you know, colonialism, number one, is a great uh, unspeakable in our, uh, in, in our culture, in our system, in, uh, in our schools. Um, you know, Italy is obsessed with uh, centennial celebrations. So in 2012, we skipped, uh, we had a great opportunity. It was 100 years from, the, from Italy's invasion of Libya. And the other thing we've never told is that Libya resisted the Italian occupation for at least 30 years. And one 
interesting element uh, now that people from Ethiopia, especially from Ethiopia, uh, are coming over to Italy, is that they're telling us a story from another country. They're talking about what we did. And uh, uh, <coughs> I just recently helped uh, put together a concert by this young woman, Gabriela Germandi. She's a writer, she's a musician, Italian father, Ethiopian mother, and she did, uh, uh, she researched the uh, Ethiopian songs of resistance, which we did, didn't even know existed. And uh, incidentally, there were a few a very few Italian communists who joined the, the Ethiopian mm -hmm. resistance in the, in the 30s and did the concert putting together traditional Ethiopian musicians and contemporary Italian, Italian ones. And it's, uh, it was absolutely wonderful. I don't know enough about Eritrea, Ethiopia, so I yet to be able to tell you how the Italian presence in influence. Uh, I know that. Um, you know, Italians were in Ethiopia only four years. So uh, enough to massacre thousands and thousands of people uh, as retaliation for uh, an attempt to kill the Italian vice lord. Uh, the Italians killed all the storytellers, seers, uh, singers in Ethiopia because they were the, they talked about resistance, they were the bearers of uh, uh, discourse of resistance. So I don't know much about Ethiopia. Somalia is more complicated because um, uh, the, uh, Italy remained in control of Somalia until 1960, even after the war. And uh, the uh, language of teaching at the University of Mogadishu was Italian. Maybe still is. They're probably shifting to English now. Um, and there's a uh, one thing that um, both Italian writers and uh, African writers point out is how much um, um, the shape of the cities was changed by the Italian architecture, uh, Asmara, Mogadishu. So that is one of the, uh, the influences. I don't know that, uh, it doesn't seem to me the little I know that uh, Italian culture left much of an imprint on the uh, on the culture and the imagination um, of, uh, of the colonized. Um, a number of words, maybe uh, another. Uh, but uh, when I talk to somebody from Ethiopia or from Eritrea. And um, somewhere from Senegal or Nigeria, I don't see much difference in terms of how they relate to it. The only, perhaps the only distinction is people from the Horn of Africa come to Italy because they speak the language. So, but say, Duru Dinfara, uh, the uh, great Somali writer, he speaks very fluent Italian, but he writes, uh, he wants to reach him. But also because uh, it's an act of resistance. Because I'm not using the, I'm using another colonial language, but another language of course to colonize me. that really attracted, uh, it really caught my attention. During your lecture, your uh, non-traditional way to see tradition, and uh, during these uh, questions and answers, how much you're using stories. So you know, it's, uh, I think we have the same problem in Spanish and like in Italian. If I say historia, that may, that may mean a history or a story. Okay, so, yeah. yeah, that's what it simply happens. And uh, when you were uh, mentioning these uh, stories, and uh, uh, also when you're playing the music, uh, one thing that came to my mind uh, was uh, the, uh, the work of uh, Fernando Ortiz. So Fernando Ortiz, uh, he, uh, he explored the, uh, the counterpoint. 
Uh, then uh, then this uh, the, the Ortiz was the, was let's say the, the first one to introduce uh, the, the the concept of the transculturation, which uh, then we found uh, we we found like in Angerama, uh, Angerama then looking at uh, Jose Maria Arguedas, a uh, Peruvian uh, no, uh, novelist and anthropologist as well. Uh, and uh, Arguedas' uh, work uh, combines the the, the the Quechua with the Spanish. So uh, it seems to me that, uh, and uh, this is one of the, the points that, that Rama makes of Arguedas, is that there is a, um, a point about the counterpoint and the intonation of the voice. What now? It, it, what, when, what the, it brings me to the question about being the crossroads is what the, I, I was saying at the beginning. How much do I, as a as an academic or a, you know academic wanna be? How much can I say about this? Because it seems to me that the, mo uh, most of these stories, or what I want to understand, is very anecdotal, which is by itself, it's, it's, not, it's not bad. We know, for example, that a memory, as uh, you were saying before, a memory of what I have becomes less factual every time I say it, because it's, 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 in, the, it's in the present. Sometimes but it becomes it's the, 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 the person in the, in the crossroads of how to make sense of something that I, I cannot, uh, I, I don't have the, the, the grasp of it. Now, uh, one thing about oral history is oral history is a is a is an artificial creation uh, because nobody uh, sits down, as you said, most narrative is anecdotal. However, here you are sitting in your house, and somebody knocks on your door and says, uh, "I'm a." oral historian, which means a professional listener, and I would like you to tell me about your life. Now that's a big challenge, because you're creating something that does not exist in nature. There is a, uh, a long, uh, consistent, tentatively consistent, you know, and people attempt to, pre to sound consistent, try to present themselves as consistent, narrative about a person's life, which never happens. I mean, uh, you know, the story, uh, nobody, you know, I'm a grand uh, my grandfather, I don't imagine my son, my grandson saying, well, grandma, would you tell me about your life? You know, 90% uh, of the times, uh, the story, it goes the other way around. Oh, grandma, forget about the war. you stop talking about the war? Or daddy, the 60s be. <laughs> and, uh, so these, uh, most of the times people, especially if you're uh, interviewing uh, non-hegemonic people or non-hegemonic genders, uh, and uh, so these are people that don't get, a, don't get to be listened much. So here comes this professional listener, and he asks you questions. And, and if he's good at his job, these would be questions that you cannot answer with a yes or no, but will generate narrative and will challenge you to not take for granted what you always take for granted. Because say, uh, okay, uh, I'm, uh, I did a project once on uh, was a story of a <coughs> Catholic children's a Catholic school for street children. So we were interviewing priests. Now, after the age of twelve, I have never spoken to a priest. Um, never had the you know series. So you go, you interview a priest, and uh, and he says, well, I. I had the calling, and I became, he said, what is the calling? Now, a priest talking to other priests or to people who share his premises was take for granted that they are talking about the same, that they know what they're talking about. But he was talking to me, and I had no idea what it means to be called by God to serve. He, not only does he have to explain it to me, but he has to explain it to himself. See what I mean? And so that the oral history interview is a challenge where, in a way, 
your um, you're challenging people to become more aware of who they are because they've never told all their life stories all in a row. So they have, they're challenged to make, to give a form to this narrative and also to explain it to somebody who's completely different. So part of the power of world history is exactly in the fact that, uh, um, that there's a difference, that there's a distance. So, um, and I think this is, in a way this is the part of the meaning of the concept of the upside down intellectual. You don't just gather what's on the ground, you change it in the process of gathering it. And, uh, and I'm not even sure that um, um, memory is, um, that memory only deteriorates. Uh, I find that uh, if I think of certain things of which I'm, that I've done, of which I'm not especially proud, every time I think about them, a new detail comes up. And things that I thought I had forgotten. Because part of forgetting is, it doesn't mean anything. I lose it because of that. But part of forgetting is um, it means too much. And uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Mario Benedetti, El Olvido está lleno de memoria. Borges, memoria es el sótano, el olvido es el sótano secreto de la memoria. So, you know, things, and these things come up in memory sometimes, especially the things if, uh, that you uh, have tried to repress. So, and because I've always thought of memory not as uh, you know, a depository of data, but as, um, uh, as a process of establish, of seeking the meaning of the past. And therefore, as you seek the meaning of the past, you've reconstructed incidentally differently each time because you're changing, because the conditions change. So it's a very dynamic process and it's not only uh, loss. It's uh, a lot of it is uh, change and uh, creation of meaning. Yes. Uh, how do you choose the people that you interview? Are, those, are all the stories relevant, or how do you choose them? Uh, I don't know if all the stories are relevant, but uh, I haven't found any story that I was, any, any narrative that I was not interested in, that I found entirely uninteresting. Uh, partly because we're talking about self-presentation, because no matter what the subject and the approach to the interview is, uh, the person will always place herself at the center of the story. Because we are the heroes of our autobiography. So we make, as we tell our autobiography, we make an, an effort to be interesting. And we usually succeed, especially if, uh, if the listener is, uh, is somebody who who likes to listen to stories. So uh, I usually found, I very seldom found people who were reluctant to be interviewed. Um, very seldom. The couple of cases were um, because it was too painful. And you know, that itself was, uh, was information. Because one of the things you don't do is, if people don't want to talk about things, you don't insist, you don't intrude. Because what the information you get is the silence, the information you get is the unspeakability. And uh, so, but other than that, you know, because people are hospitable, <laughs> and uh, everybody likes to be the center of attention. I've never really found any, as uh, 
somebody told me in, uh, in Kentucky, and she says, uh, well, after all, she says, if you were a coal miner from Wales and you came here and told us about mine safety, people would listen to you because I would have something to teach you. But you're only trying to gather a little knowledge and people are happy to help you, which I think is wonderful because, but number one, who's in control? Not the professor, but the <coughs> illiterate peasant that knows the, that knows what, you know, knows how to plant trees better than you do, or that knows his own life, which you know. And, uh, and also, the real contribution that you bring is your ignorance, because people tell you things because they think you don't know them. So I try to be in a position that I really don't know, and your willingness to learn. <coughs> The other day uh, in Winnipeg, you know, you're in Winnipeg, town you've never been there before and then. So I, I'm going home with two incredible interviews. One with the uh, son of the founder and present uh, leader of the Ukrainian Labor Temple, who had incredible stories about it. Labor in the, labor in Winnipeg about music. A left wing Ukrainian is something we in Italian <laughs> imagine. <laughs> they have a whole left wing labor. And the other is with this extraordinary woman from Salvador, who uh, told me the story of what happened when Archbishop Romero was killed and his funeral and his beatification and, and, uh, and she said something very sweet. She said, uh, I'm about to go back to Salvador, but I have two loves. And uh, one is Salvador, which is vile uh, and dirty, but it's my first love. And the other is Canada, which is calm and uh, reassuring. So I said, it's like Donna Flores' two husbands. <laughs> she says, exactly. <laughs> you know, and she has his two loves, Canada and Salvador. But you know, wonderful stories are just out there. Incidentally, there, there must be a number of very interesting stories in this room. I've done a number of projects with younger people. Um, for if you're interested in the history of student movements, you will not interview the elders, you'll interview uh, teenagers. And they have fascinating narratives, very interesting stories. So, because that's the other little mantra that I always uh, use. I always say the same things, but fortunately, different people. <laughs> memory is not a disease you catch when you get old. You know, we're born with memory, and we start having memory. We start remembering. Now, have you ever seen how how much little children love to go through photography albums? That's memory. Two years old, and they're already living in the past. <laughs> so, I think, and, and this I think is important because you know, I was talking to a high school class yesterday in Winnipeg, and finally I ended up formulating in a way I've never done it before. Look, because they were talking about the First Nations and the elders, and I said, look, in 50 years, you'll be the elders. And people will come to you to ask you, what was the you know, Winnipeg like 50 years ago? And if you don't pay attention now, you won't be able to answer that then. So memory begins with paying attention to where you are, to being, begins with being an active, a citizen and participatory democracy, more or less. Mm. Okay, I'm sounding wiser than I am. We always can invent something. But we always can invent something. But my question is, um, what happened with all the information that you collect? 
how you decide how to choose the parts that you're going to put in your right when you finish the job? Ah, uh, in a way it's like sifting, mm -hmm. uh, but it really depends. Again, it's a dialogue, because the interview is a dialogue to begin with. Interview. You're looking at them, they're looking at you. Uh, and the writing is all, uh, of oral history is also a dialogue between you and the material you've collected. That is, uh, you have a project in mind. If you write a book, this book has a theme. Uh, so you will you know, you sift the material and you come up with the things that are relevant to your theme. But then you realize that maybe the material is telling you something else. Because one of the great things about this, this whole work is serendipity. If I went to do an inter I did an interview with this union organizer about what unions were like in the 1940s. I had not interesting. I ended up having a fantastic narrative of sexual initiation and brothels in the 1920s and 30s. <laughs> 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 and, and that got in the book. But uh, you know, I interviewed this lady about her brother who was in the underground. She talks about it, but she wants to talk about her love story. Uh, she, a uh, working class woman, fashion, uh, communist family falls in love with this fascist who treats us exactly like you would expect a stereotype fascist to treat her. So in the end, there are two lines in the book about her brother and the chapter about her. <laughs> because uh, the material keeps telling you, no, no, look, you, have, you should change your agenda. You should change the direction of where you're going to include this. Also partly because you know, I come from literature, not history, and in literature, when you have a good story, you don't you don't throw it away. So, uh, so it's really a dialogue. Uh, I start out writing the history of this uh, religious school for three children, thinking that certain things were relevant. And as I was sifting the material, I realized that everybody was talking about shoes. How important shoes are. I had not. I had not thought about it and had not asked about it, because of course in an interview you know to ask certain things and then uh, you know, the person you're talking to wants to tell you something else and sometimes this point. So this is the way it goes. And uh, the other thing that most people do with our history is that we quote a lot. We quote a lot because we feel that um, there's more meaning in the narratives than you can elicit in an explanation. So that you know, by quoting them widely, you leave you leave them you leave them open to a, a different uh, reading and interpretation by it, by the books. And then, of course, now we can do a lot with uh, with sound. You know, we're talking about the intonation of the voice uh, nowadays. You can publish in sound. I have done a few things in sound where you can hear the voices, and that's, uh, that's one of the main possibilities of technology today. Well, let me thank <coughs> Professor Cortelli on behalf of all of us. It was, I think I can simply say, it was a wonderful talk, engaging us all. So now you have to come back to Andrew another time for more than two hours. <laughs> or otherwise we'll all come to Rome. You choose. <laughs> okay.